Welcome to Modern Aikidoist Podcast. I'd like to start out by thanking the listeners who have liked and commented on the videos or sent me their own private comments about how much they like these podcasts. Your interest and support is noticed and deeply appreciated. Thank you very much. So far, I'm enjoying putting together these podcasts for you, and I'm noticing that by far the most listens and views are coming out of YouTube. YouTube is going through a major upheaval at this point, which started around last year and seems to be now boiling over. It appears YouTube is going through a change in its commercial model, and it's trying to turn itself into more of a Netflix type of a platform. Small channels and content providers are being neglected, and there's little promise of a future for them, and that includes this podcast. Therefore, I'm looking for other platforms to deliver this podcast to you. I'll definitely make an announcement prior to changing over, but uh, a change is definitely coming probably in the next month or so. So now let's get on with the subject of the podcast. A listener asked me a great question just recently and expressed an interest in having a podcast on the topic of different styles of Aikido. Thanks for the question and the interest in hearing about it. Let's take a look at that subject. Styles and organizations kind of are seen as going hand in hand. So let's talk about organizations uh, to start out with. There are quite a few Aikido organizations ranging from worldwide in scope to regional as well as dojos which are not affiliated with any organization. Essentially, they're independent. The first organization everyone should know about for sure is Aikikai, which is the organization led by Morohai Ueshiba's grandson, Moroteru Ueshiba. Aikikai, which is sometimes referred to as the Aikikai, has dojos all over the world and is by far the largest. One might think that since it is the organization with the direct connection to the Ueshiba family, that it controls how Aikido is practiced generally. Uh, and this is not the case. It doesn't control Aikido or really even influence it outside its own organization. This may not make sense because of what we are used to with the standardization in many other industries. More on that in a little bit. I'll get a bit more into the details of what styles are, but before I do that, it's worth mentioning a few well-known organizations and their, their approaches to Aikido. In no particular order, here are a few of the most well-known. Many are affiliated with Aikikai, and some are not. The first that comes to mind is Iwama Aikido. Iwama is a city in Japan where Osensei had a dojo. There's quite a bit to the history of the Iwama dojo, but I'll stick to only the major details here. Osensei taught at the Iwama dojo while the Tokyo dojo was overseen primarily by other senior students. At the time of Osensei's passing, Kuichi Tohei was the chief instructor of Hambu Dojo in Tokyo, and Morihiro Saito became chief instructor of Iwama Dojo. Saito felt it important to preserve Osensei's teaching as much as possible and strictly kept to the techniques and teaching exactly as Osensei showed them. As I understand it, Saito created many of the weapons katas we see in Aikido. He did this as a way to help remember and teach the movements Osensei did with the weapons. Osensei himself did not teach any weapons katas. Iwama Aikido is known for being a harder type of Aikido and very similar to the Aikido Osensei was teaching before he passed. I admit I've never trained in an Iwama-affiliated dojo, so I can't speak from first-hand experience of what Iwama Aikido is like. Koichi Tohei resigned from the Aikikai a few years after Osensei's passing after differences with the doshu, Morihai's son Koshimaru. Tohei went on to found Shinshin Toitsu Aikido, which later evolved into Ki Society. Tohei was widely known as both a powerful and extremely competent Aikidoka as well as a good teacher. Osensei often used Tohei for demonstrations and challenges. A notable example can be seen on an old film made in the 1950s called Aikido Rendezvous with Adventure. I'll leave a link to that in the description of this podcast. Tohei was charged with introducing Aikido to America, which he did starting with a visit to Hawaii. Koichi Tohei had a strong influence on American Aikido, and quite a few Aikido practitioners have Tohei's influences in their Aikido. The Ki Society Aikido is known for being heavily focused on energy exercises and Ki development, Ki meaning energy. It's a softer style which does not stress self-defense. To my knowledge, the Ki Society is not affiliated with the Aikikai. Koichi Tohei retired from teaching in 2007 and passed away in 2011. Yoshimitsu Yamada and Mitsugi Saotome are both students of Osensei and each heads up their own organization here in the United States. Yamada Shihan is president of the United States Aikido Federation, USAF, and Saotome Shihan is the founder and chief instructor for Aikido Schools of Ueshiba, or ASU. 
Both of these organizations are affiliated with the Aikikai. Yoshinkan Aikido was found by Gozo Shioda, who was a direct student of Osensei. Yoshinkan is the second largest Aikido organization in the world after Aikikai. From my experience, you can recognize Yoshinkan by the very distinct stances and guard positions they use. As far as I know, Yoshinkan is not affiliated with Aikikai. Another notable organization is Shotokan Aikido Federation, which is often referred to as Tomiki Aikido. It was founded by Kenji Tomiki, who is a professional teacher. Shotokan Aikido focuses on a free-form sparring and even has tournament competitions. As far as I know, Shotokan Aikido is not affiliated with the Aikikai, but I could be mistaken about that. There are other organizations as well, which range in size from a dozen or more dojos down to just a handful. Do they teach different styles of Aikido? Well, the answer is yes and no. I know that doesn't really make sense at first blush, but let me try to explain. The fast food chain McDonald's sells hamburgers, but so does Burger King and Wendy's. Their burgers are all a bit different from one another, but are all fundamentally similar. That's pretty straightforward. If you go into a McDonald's just about anywhere, you will get a burger virtually identical to any other McDonald's burger. The same is not true of Aikido dojos. They have not standardized their product the way almost all franchise chains have. In fact, I would say it's even impossible to standardize a martial art without watering it down so much that it's ineffective. There are martial arts franchises who have done this and made themselves prosperous by doing so. The quality of what they offer as a martial art is well known for being, frankly, very poor. They do offer great camaraderie, exercise, body control, and a bunch of other good things, so they're not a loss. My point is not to judge or condemn them, but to look at them for what they are. They are martial arts-flavored exercise programs, and there's nothing wrong with that. Dojos who do this are often referred to as Mick Dojos. A part of the reason for the poor reputation of these dojos is not their program as much as how they are known for fleecing students and parents, especially, with extra fees and exploitive contracts. Anyway, that's branching off into another topic. Let's get back to the styles. Any martial art is an art, and as such, it's heavily influenced by the artist and their personal interpretation. Martial artists and fighters all have their strengths and their weaknesses. Each of them has their favorite techniques, which they do extremely well and tend to focus on. They also have nuanced ways of applying techniques. A notable example of this is Steven Seagal and Tenshin Aikido. I didn't mention Tenshin Aikido previously because it's not an organization. Seagal founded a dojo in Orange County, California named Tenshin Dojo. Seagal had a rather distinct and recognizable way of doing techniques which was very powerful. He was always affiliated with Aikikai and remains so today as of the recording of this podcast. Yet the way he does Aikido looks different from most other Aikidoka. Seagal's students tend to follow his example to one degree or another. They use techniques which few other Aikidoka use, yubidori or finger-grabbing techniques, for example. The term Tenshin Aikido now refers to this type of Aikido and is still taught by a handful of the remaining students from that time and dojo, most notably Haru Matsuoka-sensei, who is the chief instructor of Aikido Doshinokai Association. Don't worry if you can't keep all these names and organizations straight. There's a lot to remember, and I'm not going very deep into them. At any rate, what about styles? Surely all these organizations and dojos must vary quite a bit in what they offer. Well, yeah, they do. They even vary quite a bit if you go to a different dojo within the same organization. Remember, martial arts training is not like hamburgers. There are very notable differences from instructor to instructor. No two teachers are alike. No two martial artists are alike, both in how they do their art and then how they teach it. Because of this, Aikido has as many styles as it has practitioners. It's more like music than hamburgers. Not all guitarists are the same. Each has their own sound and and the type of music they like to play. Some are similar, but there are distinct differences. Some are instantly recognizable by their style. Aikido and Aikido practitioners are more like this. A martial artist's style is based on things that work well for them because of their bodies, their attitudes, as well as their personalities. Some techniques or tactics suit them very well. Those very same things might not be well suited to another martial artist, even within the same art. Here's an example I'll share from my own experience. I had a love-hate relationship with Shihonage for several years when I started training Aikido. Here is an example I'll share from my own experience. I had a love-hate relationship with Shionage for several years when I started training Aikido. 
The reason was that I was at least four inches taller than any of my training partners, and I had to drop down underneath their shoulder level to execute shihonage properly, and it always felt clumsy. It didn't help I couldn't emulate my instructor as he was only about 5'9 or so. It was easier for him to move under Uke's shoulder than it was for me. Sometimes being tall and having long legs is a detriment. After more than a year or so of wrestling with Shihonage, I started to feel like it was just never going to be a good technique for me. That is, unless I had an Uke who was around my same height or taller. In that circumstance, it seemed like it would be pretty viable. Then something major happened. I got to see a Sandan exam where the Nage was about an inch taller than I was, and his Uke was about five foot six. He swept in, turned, and dropped Uke like the wind. It was amazing how smooth and powerful he was, but yet he kept good posture all the way through. It was a splendid example that showed me that it could be done, so I got to work and I finally tamed Shihonage. I mention this because it relates to style. It's quite possible I may, might have written off Shionage and not really integrated into my Aikido. I think all Aikido works much the same way, with the curriculum of a particular instructor being dictated largely by his or her strengths and preferred techniques. Sometimes an instructor brings their approach or nuances to techniques which are distinctive and different. An easily recognizable example is Steven Seagal's version of a Riminage, which looks like a vicious clothesline. Another example I'll share is from my own experience, and it's a bit more subtle. It has to do with a finish to Sankyo, which I inherited from an instructor in my lineage, Bill Sosa-sensei. I was a visiting student at a seminar held by another Aikido organization. We were being showed Sankyo and practicing it with partners. I went to finish as I had been taught, which was to establish the Sankyo lock, and then you turn into Uke and lift him slightly, and as he's lifted, you start a cut down, and you cut the arm and drop him to the floor. Someone nearby saw me do that and asked if I was Bill Sosa's student because he recognized it as being a trademark Sosa movement. As I learned more and studied how other seniors in Shihan performed technique, it was more clear that each had their favorite techniques and even trademark nuances of how they performed them. To me, this is the beauty of the art of Aikido, that each artist brings their own flavor to it. I'd also like to say that there are more organizations in Shihans out there, and it's not my intention to slight any of them by not mentioning them. There are just too many to list. Another factor is that organizations fracture, usually due to politics, and new organizations form on a regular basis. As time passes, it's harder to keep up with the shifts in organizations, new ones, and ones which are now defunct. Even ones which go through a change can change fundamentally under new leadership. Uh, but that's another subject entirely. I hope you enjoyed this basic answer to the styles of Aikido. In the end, it doesn't pay to compare them or look to answer which one is better. They each have their own traits, and finding one which suits your interests is the most important factor. I've been asked countless times how to find a dojo or martial art, so that will be the subject of the next podcast. What are other topics you're interested in hearing covered in this podcast? Please share your ideas in the comments section if you're watching this on YouTube. You can also go to the Facebook group Aikido the Marshall side and post a comment there. Your input and engagement helps podcasts like these stay around. Please support by liking, subscribing, and sharing. Enjoy your training!